Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Um, we're just going to jump right in. I just need to switch over to my hot spot right quick. One sec. All right, so we were supposed to uh, have someone present that last problem. The uh, wrong notes. The uh, last limited reacting problem. So, do we have a volunteer for that, or somebody who can who can help walk us through that? Let me go ahead and share that. I guess I can try. I'm not even sure if I got it right or not, though. That's okay. We, that's why we do it now. Do it now, get it corrected, and then that way you see it on the test, and you get it, and it's no problem. All right. Let me stop my video, too. All right, uh, go ahead. Do you wanna walk? You wanna just tell me what, what to do <laughs> and I'll write it down or you wanna annotate the screen yourself? Uh, I can just tell you what I did. Go ahead, give, give me first first step. Okay, so to figure out um, the percent yield, we need actual yield over theoretical yield. Okay. So, because we get that the uh, actual yield of the reactant is 75 grams, mm -hmm. all we need is the theoretical yield. So therefore we have to find the weight of um, what we would get for the weight as uh, of the CH3OH, right? Yep. So that's the actual yield that they gave us, good. And we want the percent. So you said that's actual over theoretical times 100. Okay, I'm with you. They gave us the actual yield of 75 grams and you said we need to find the theoretical. Yes. So what, what's the first thing we need to do towards finding the theoretical yield? Get the uh, molar mass. Okay. So molar mass of or CO, is that right? I didn't even know what CO was. The, I uh, got it for the CH3OH. Well, we're going to need that too. Okay. So let's, let's say that. So molar mass of CO and methanol. What did you get for this one? Um, I got, what did I get? 32 grams. All right, good. And CO will be 28 grams. Yeah. All right, that's good. So we, we, we got we got something to work with. What, what, what are you gonna do next? Hold up, let me finish this eight. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, since we need, since we have both molar masses, we'd put um, what we need on top and we want to get rid of on the bottom and we'd multiply it by um, I'm not sure actually what we'd multiply them both by. Well, well we're not going to touch right. this one yet. We're not going to touch the, the CH3OH yet. We're going to leave that. That's at the end. Okay, we so well, now we need to take that molar that the molar mass and the mass given up here, because we it, we already said it's limiting because the other reactant is excess in this equation right here. So we could take that 
100 grams and divide it by the molar mass of CO, that's going to give us moles of CO. So we need that, right? Because because that's how we're going to find out how much uh, methanol we get in moles. So if we do that calculation, take up 100 grams and we divide by uh, the 28 grams per mole um, molar mass. I said 28, it should be 38, my bad. That's 12, no, that's right, 28. 12 and 16. I think I used 38 in, in that class this morning. I have to let them know that that's the wrong mass. But that's okay. So 28 grams per mole there. And then we if we take that and divide it, what, what, what should we get? We got 3.57. Pretty good. So this is 3.57 moles of CO. All right, so now we got that. That's our limiting reagent. That means that that's going to control how much uh, methanol we actually create. And based on, so now we need to now we need to use that our stoichiometry. Right from the equation. So it's C O plus H2 going to CH3 O H. And there's a two here, but it doesn't matter because the limiting reactant and the CH3 O H, we're going to look at those two. I heard you say something earlier. You want to find you're looking for something and you're going to put that in the top. And then what you want to get rid of, you put in the bottom. So here we want to find out how many moles of this we get from the number of moles of this. So that is going to be 3.57. Hold up. Let me just add in a page. All right, so that'll be 3.57 moles of CO. What's the ratio between uh, CO and CH3OH? You can, the number in front, if there's nothing there, it's assumed to be what? One, so it would be one to one. So, so one mole of methanol over one mole of CO. So you can cancel out the moles of CO. So obviously that's gonna be no change in that number. All right, so that's that. Now what would you do? You got moles of CH3OH, but you need grams to get the theoretical yield. You got to do molar mass again. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take that molar mass of 32 grams per mole. Grams is moles times molar mass. So it's going to be 3.57 moles times uh, 32 grams per mole. So this is going to be 3.57 times that. And it looks like it's uh, 114.28. Is that right? Yeah, so that's what I got. All right, so that's that. So now we got the theoretical yield in grams. And based on that, we can find the percent yield. Because it gave us an amount up top. It gave us 75 grams that actually got made. So we can find percent yield
and it is actual over theoretical times 100. So we can just put, plug those numbers in. 75 divided by 114.28 grams of gun. That's why it has to be in grams because you want to cancel it out and get a percentage. And that's going to be um, about a 65.63. 65.63. Yes. All right, great. So in the in the earlier class, I talked about this and to help you understand like what all this, how all this applies, right? Let's say if you were doing this reaction in a lab and let's say you're running it in a round bottom flask. So a round bottom flask is exactly that, it's shaped like a, it's got a round bottom and a neck coming up like that. And let's say you seal this up with a rubber septum. So we're gonna close that off. So this is your reaction vessel. And then you put a, a septum on it to seal it up. All right? And so what you're doing, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pipe in through a, a basically a little either a cannula or like a needle with the holes on the end of it connected to some, some gas source, right? Because both CO2, I'm, I'm sorry, CO and H2 are gases, right? So this is CO plus H2 going to CH2. Right? So you're going to have a, a tube coming in here. It's going to be H2 gas. And you'll have another tube coming in from the other side. That's going to be CO gas, right? And when those gases <laughs> get into the round bottom flask and you heat them up, more than likely you're probably doing this at a little bit of elevated temperature, uh, then you're going to generate methanol, right? But you're going to, you can surmise like pretty easily that if both of these are gases, and let's say you have a small, like a leak in your hose, or let's say your, uh, your tank, the regulator is not on tights, anything, you're gonna lose some of that gas. And so when you get a 65% yield like this, right, that's a, that's a not, it's not horrible, but it's also not ideal either. So 65% is it's decent, but when you think about how this reaction is happening, you're probably gonna lose a uh, little bit of gas uh, when you're adding it. So you're probably gonna lose some star material. So you have to justify that. I'm gonna say possibly due to, not due to. So loss of star material. Right, so that's, remember we talked about the fact that you never get 100%. That's one of the reasons why you won't ever get 100% yield is because, you know, if you're working with gases, then obviously uh, you're gonna lose some of that somehow, right? So, so you may not get uh, an actual 100 grams of CO in the flash. You might only get 98 or 88, and that's gonna end up causing that yield to be lower, all right? So that's that. That's good, uh, Nazir. Thank you. So we're going to uh, switch gears, and the next section is going to be dealing with titration. And this is a different topic. And with titration, that particular topic we're dealing with, it's, a, it's an analytical technique. All right, so what, what we're doing, and I'm going to show you a, a video first, uh, but this is actually a technique one that goes by the name of volumetric analysis.
All right, so you got two liquids. But you have uh, one with unknown concentration. All right, so the purpose of titration is to figure out what the concentration of one of those liquids is with respect to uh, another liquid of a known concentration, right? So you, so this is a, uh, a technique used to determine concentration, right? So you have, I have a little setup here, but I wanna show you this video first before uh, I go through the setup. All right, and, I'm, and I'll show you. So let me switch screens. I already have that uh, video pulled up. I had it pulled up. Shucks. It's on YouTube looking at this thing this morning. Uh, Intended to save it, but I, I closed everything out before I started Zoom so it wouldn't crash. But that's all right. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it together. Let me see. Where's my, my history. Uh, right there. All right. Everyone knows that wireless saving to me is kind of family. Oh, with visible, I get unlimited data. All right. So with with um, titration, <laughs> there's a couple of things I want to talk about here before I start the video. And it's a silent video, so I'm kind of walk you through it. So right here, you have a video. um, sir. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, is the video supposed to be on the screen right now? Because all I see is your uh, files. Oh no. What about now? Okay, now I see it, yeah, thank you. All right, All right, so we have a, this is a an example of a titration setup. So you have on a burette, which is here, and it, that burette contains a certain volume of what we call the titrant, and you know the concentration of your titrant, in this case, is sodium hydroxide. This is the most basic titration that you can do, an acid-based titration with sodium hydroxide as the titrant, and in the, uh, Erlenmeyer flask, you have um, HCl, right? That's, your, that's what we call your analyte. And in the flask, you also have an indicator. And that indicator changes colors at what's called the equivalence point. That's the point where the reaction ends. And uh, uh, supposedly, the number of moles of titrant and the number of moles of analyte are equivalent. So that's where you, that's, what, that's the point where it ends. So you have also have a, and, and let me show you how, how this works. So you can see right here, you have protons or the little green or teal colored atoms. And then you have uh, chloride anions, which are the green colored uh, atoms or ions. And what you're gonna do is add sodium hydroxide. We don't know the concentration of HCl in this uh, Erlenmeyer, but we can determine it. And I'm gonna show you how in a second. All right, so you don't know the concentration here, but you know the concentration here, and you're going to get to a point where you're also going to know the volume. So with titration, it kind of brings us back to uh, some concepts that we already know about. We know about uh, molarity and how to manipulate moles and volume and concentration. If we have any two of those, we can calculate the third, uh, and that's how that's what this this type of titration acid based titration allows us to do so i'm going to play this you're going to see that there's there's a little bit of as a little bit of the titrant that's going to be added at a time so you add an aliquot and the indicator is necessary because without the indicator you don't know when the when the equivalence point is reached but you'll see so they're going to add five mils right and nothing happens, you hadn't changed colors, then they add another five mils, and you can see right here the pH is changing, becoming more basic. So you add another five mils, and now you got a little bit more uh, 
reaction going on between the acid and the base. And add another five mils, and now you have 1.6 pH. And then another five milliliters added. And you, you're getting closer, but the color hasn't changed yet. So if the color hasn't changed, that means the reaction is still going, right? So here's the point right here. And I don't know if you can actually see that, but the color goes to a pale pink color and the pH goes to seven, right? So what that means is that this is now neutral. There's no longer any acid-base chemistry going on. And the uh, all the protons have been picked up by the hydroxyl um, anion from NaOH and then the sodium cation and the chlorine or the chloride anion, they are all in solution, right? So at this point, we started out at 60 mils of HCl, and then at the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, there's a, the solution is 90 mils. So that means I added 30 milliliters of NaOH. And so if I know the, the volume of NaOH that I added, which was 30 mils, and I also know the concentration of NaOH, which is 0.2 molar, I can figure out how many moles that is. And once I figure out how many moles that is, I can use that uh, number of moles and the balanced equation between NaOH and HCl going to NaCl and, and water, I can use that balanced equation to figure out how many moles of HCl is there and figure out the molarity of the HCl. All right, so with that being said, let's go back to here. And I'll send you, I'll send you this link when I send this out uh, later on today. Um, and let's go through and label this diagram. Right. We have basically um, the titrant, which is here. So the titrant is a standard solution of known concentration. We got it. We have to know the uh, concentration of the titrant. Otherwise, we if we don't know it, then we can't figure out the concentration of the analyte. So that's a standard solution uh, of known concentration. We have to know that, right? The way the, the setup also requires what we call a burette. And that's just a simple piece of glassware. Uh, it's, it's graduated. <laughs> so every line on there is indicative, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's either 10 mils or five mils. Uh, each line represents five milliliters. And your typical uh, burette will hold up to 100 milliliters of a solution. Um, and then the analyte, which is here, right, I, that, that is my, um, that's the substance that I would like to, I want to find the concentration of. So the analyte is what I'm looking for. I'm trying to uh, determine the concentration of the analyte. So titration allows me to do that. All right, so my analyte is there. And then after a certain point in time, that, that uh, indicator that I use, because I have to have an indicator in the uh, solution with the analyte, that indicator is gonna cause this to, to change colors. Right, so this is not this is no longer going to be right. So now I have an indicator in solution with the analyte. 
and it's going to change colors. But it only changes colors at the equivalence point. Right, all it changes colors at the equivalence point. And what that indicates is that that's the end of the reaction. So that's why the reaction stops. When that, when that um, analyte solution, when the indicator changes colors, that tells me that the reaction is over. And then what I need to do at that point, is go back to the burette and measure how much titrant I added. So there's another piece of information here that we can kind of uh, give you. And that is that in the burette, and you probably have remember this from uh, G Chem in high school, you have a, uh, like the line, when you look at the, the uh, burette, right? The, there's kind of a curvature to the solution, like the top. Work. It's kind of a little bit of a curvature there. So that's where you read from. You don't read from the top part of that curve. You actually read from the bottom of it. So even though this might be, let's say, uh, 50 milliliters, that line may say 50. Right, the bottom of the curve actually may be at 49.7 or something like that. So you actually read from this bottom part right here. So that might be 49.7. I'm just estimating. But you all, that, that little curve at the, that the solution has kind of from gravity pressing down on it is what we call the meniscus. And I'm pretty sure you, you remember that from high school if you did a any type of titration. Uh, you always read that burette from the bottom of the meniscus. Right, always. That that volume after you've added so much of your titrant, the let the final volume is what we call the endpoint. Right, that's the endpoint. That tells me uh, how exactly how much titrant I added to bring about that equivalence. So it tells me how much, what the volume was, uh, how much of that titrant it took to get to that equivalence point. All right, so all this, this little setup, this titration setup is standard. Any, I think we have a titration lab that we're gonna do because we're almost at the end. We got, I think we got two experiments left before we're done. Uh, but we're gonna do lemon and reactant next week and I think titration the week after that. Um, but yeah, so, so you have this setup, and this is again, a volumetric analysis where you can use the concentration of one of your titrant to determine the concentration of your analyte. So your analyte is in the flash, your titrant is being added to the flash. So let's do an example. Any questions about that, uh, by the way, before we go any further? All right, so let's do an example. Uh, so let's take HCl, just like we did, just like was in the video, plus NaOH, 
And that's going to, this is an acid base reaction. So it's going to give me a salt, which is NaCl plus water. All right. And the HCl is going to be my analyte. The NaOH is going to be my titrant. And we're going to figure out, in this example, we're going to figure out what the concentration of HCl is. So I'm, rather than writing out the whole problem, I'm just going to give you the information. So the, we have a, the analyte is a 50 50 mil sample, all right? The titrant, in order to get to the equivalence point, the end point was 35.23 milliliters. And the concentration for the molarity is 0 0.250 molar. So we really know everything we need from that. So the, the titrant, the, the amount added was 35.23. And then it has a molarity of 0.25 molar. And then for the analyte, that sample is a total of 50 milliliters. So that's 50 mils of analyte in that Erlenmeyer flask. So what we want to do with this information is to determine the analyte concentration. Right. And remember, concentration is in moles per liter. So all, all your units are either going to have to be moles or liters, no matter what you start with. Even if you started with grams, you're still going to have to get to moles. And if your volume is in any other unit other than liters, you're going to have to um, convert it. All right, so let, let, let's let that be the first thing that we do. First thing we're going to do is convert all of our volumes into liters. Sorry about that. Everything to liters. So we got for our HCL, we got a 50 milliliter sample, and we're going to convert that into liters by using the conversion factor. One liter is 1,000 milliliters. So that's going to cancel. So that ends up being 0 0.050 liters. And then for NaOH, same thing is 35.23 milliliters. I'm going to do the same thing times, <laughs> excuse me, one liter over 1,000 milliliters. So that's going to be 0 0.03523 liters. So now we got our volumes where we need them, which is great. Now what we need to do is convert the amount of NaOH that we added into moles. In order to do that, we need the concentration. All right, so if you remember, Concentration is moles per liter. So the concentration and liter liters is a uh, volume, right? So the concentration times the volume will give us moles. And we know the concentration, right? The concentration of sodium hydroxide was 0.25, right? And the 
volume we just calculated to be 0 0.03523 liters. All right, any questions about that? So liters are gonna cancel. Let me go ahead and, and swap this out and put moles. All right, so the liters will cancel here. We're left with moles. Can somebody calculate that real quick? Uh, I got a zero point zero zero eight eight. Okay, zero point zero zero. Eight eight, and that's moles of N A O H. All right, now we're home. We're in the home stretch. We need to find out how many moles of HCl reacted, and we can do that because all we got, all we need to do now is take that balanced equation and find the stoichiometry between HCl and N A O H and convert one to the other. So let's write the equation out again. We're gonna use the balanced equation. To find that stoichiometric ratio. So balanced equation, get down here. We're going to use that to find a stoichiometric ratio. So let's just write it out again. It is NaOH plus HCl going to NaCl plus H. All right, it's all balanced. So what is the ratio of NaOH <laughs> to HCl for the coefficients in front of the, in front of the substance? If there's nothing there, it's understood to be what? One. One. And I want and I want to solve for HCl. So I want that in the top. I'm gonna put one mole, this is my ratio of HCl over one mole of NaOH. I'm solving for HCl and I'm gonna use the moles of NaOH that I determined up here, down here. That's times 0 0.0088 moles of NaOH. Right, so moles of NaOH is going to cancel. And since it's one to one, the number is not going to change. So 0 0.0088 moles of HCl. All right, so that's that. That's not it, though. It didn't ask us to find the moles of HCl, it asked us to find the concentration. And so now we need to do that. We need to find. molarity of HCl. And that's, that's, that's trivial at this point. Molarity, we know, is moles over liters. We learned that already back way back in the day. And so now all we need to do is put the number of moles here, 0 0.0088. Over the volume of the HCl solution, not the total volume, but the volume of the solution that we started with, which was 50 milliliters or 0 0.050 liters. 
Once you calculate that, then you'll we'll, we'll have the concentration of uh, HCl. All right, anybody got it? Zero point one seven six. Yep, and that's that. So this is my concentration of HCl. So the pattern, the way we solved this, we took all our volumes and made it into liters. And then we went and we took what we knew. We knew the volume of NaOH and we also knew the concentration of NaOH. So we took those two uh, values and then we used those to determine the number of moles of NaOH. All right, and then once we figure out the number of moles of NaOH, we use that and we use that to find the number of moles of HCl, right? Because in the balanced equation, we just took the stark metric ratio of those two and solved for HCl. All right, and then once we did that, then we found out the concentration of HCl by taking that number of moles that we just solved for and dividing it by the volume of the HCl mm -hmm. solution. And any titration problem is going to be the same way. They're all going to have, uh, they're all going to have the same, follow the same format for solving for the concentration of the analyte. The only thing that they may give you differently is it may be a different type of titration. It might be a redox titration or something like that. But the, the format and the pattern to solve it is the same. Your volumes have to be in liters. Uh, you're always going to use moles and not grams or some other unit. And the concentration uh, is always going to be moles over liters, right? It's the same pattern, no matter what the problem, what numbers you're given. As long as you know the concentration of the titrant and the endpoint volume, as long as you know those two values and you got a balanced equation, you can solve any of these titration problems. All right, any uh, questions about this? No, sir. All right, if not, we're gonna stop here. On Friday, we're gonna pick up on um, chapter five. We're gonna start chapter five. Uh, if 